meet with you. So we encourage you to be open to what he has for you today. If you have any questions or concerns about this morning, you can find one of the pastors or you can look for our hospitality team members wearing a tag like this and they will be happy to help you or direct you to someone who has the answer to your question. If you're exploring Eaglemont Church as a newcomer, again, we're excited about that. After the gathering today, our hosts would love to meet you in our newcomers lounge that is out the auditorium doors and down the hall to the right. Thanks for giving us that opportunity. Hi, my name's Charity and I'm the Children and Family Ministries Pastor here at Eaglemont Church. I wanna let you know about our Sunday Children's Program. If you have kids grade six and under, we have specific programming on Sunday mornings. If they're here in the auditorium with you right now, please head out into the foyer to check them in so that they can head to their classes. For more information, head to eaglemont.info and click on the Eaglemont Kids button. Please notice the reserve signs on some of the back rows. They're reserved for parents with small children. If you do not have small children and you're sitting in those rows, please move forward. Thanks. If your child wants to stay with you, but isn't enjoying the preaching, sorry, Pastor Marlo, we have a few options for you. Moms, there's a mother's room just outside the auditorium doors and a little to the right. There's a TV in there and you can watch the message. If your child's a little older or you're not a mother, we have a family room on the second floor. Just find the stairs in the lobby by the main entrance. You can listen to the message in there. If you have any questions, please find me or any member of the Eaglemont Kids staff. If you have any questions about Eaglemont Church or what it means to be a Christ follower, we would love to help you find some answers. Please visit our website at eaglemont.church where you can find more information about Eaglemont as well as contact information for the church office and the pastoral staff. So once again, we welcome you to Eaglemont. We're so glad you're here. Morning, everyone. Why don't you stand with us?
everyone. Welcome to Eagle Mont Church. For those of you who are here in person or if you are engaging with us online, we are just so glad that you're here. I just want to encourage you all to open your heart and your mind to God this morning. And before we pray, we just wanted to let those who are engaging with us online know that in a few moments we'll be partaking in communion. So if you'd like to do that with us and join in that, we just wanted to let you know to take a second to grab some crackers and some juice or whatever you have to be able to do that with us. Would you bow your heads and pray with me? God, we just thank you for your love and we thank you for your goodness and your grace. We thank you for your patience with us, Lord God. We thank you for who you are. And we just pray, Lord, here that this morning we would be able to learn something new from you, God, this morning, to hear from you, God, we pray that our hearts would be open to listen to your voice, Jesus. We thank you for this time. We get to worship you together, God. Thank you for this time. We get to honor and praise you. May we not take that for granted, Lord. We love you so much, God. Amen. Continue to worship with us this morning.
just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind cause I know there is peace within your presence I speak Jesus Every stronghold shine through the shadows. 
we're just going to continue to worship. We're, as you see, we're going to um, take a time of communion right away. Um, if you're new to Eagle Mont or new to Christianity, communion is uh, something that we do as a church uh, every month, not just because of tradition, not just because it's something that we do, but because it's a reminder of what Jesus has done for us. And it's a time to reflect and have a, have a, a posture, a heart of gratitude and just amazement for what God has done, for what Jesus has done. And um, yeah, we're going to have this time of communion together because it helps remind us and remember that Jesus was, was killed, put on a cross, humiliated, took on all sin and, and pain, and he did that for us. And then he says, this is my body and my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. And as his disciples today, we continue this tradition to remember that he has defeated sin and death and now lives in us. So in a, as the band begins to play, you can come forward and grab uh, your communion emblems. There's gluten-free ones as well. And as we sing, just reflect on those words. If you know it, sing along um, for this time of communion. You can, you can come forward as the band begins to play.
Thank you, Jesus. Let's just join, join me in prayer as, and agree with me in your own heart as you just pray this with a heart of, of, of thankfulness and really in awe of what he has done. So let's pray. God, we thank you. We thank you that we can come to this place and worship you. God, that we can come together in community and draw near to you, be shaped by you, God. Really encounter the living God because we know that, that you, you died and you took that suffering for us, God, but we know that you rose again. And now you're here and you're working and you're moving, God. So we just thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for what you've done, God. We thank you for, for everything. Jesus, in our own heart, in our own words, we just, we thank you for the cross. God, we thank you that you came down in, in human form to save us. That you know what it is to, to be human. You know what it is to, to suffer, to have pain. You are not a God that that doesn't understand. That's way off in the distance. You are here. You are walking on this earth with us. And thank you, God, that the, that was the only way. And you did that for us, to save us, to give us new life. You suffered. You died on a cross for us. And most importantly, because we're still here today, you've, we've given new life because you were raised again. Jesus, we just thank you. We thank you. We say thank you. Sometimes that's all we can say. And as we, as we thank you, God, we also commit to following you in greater ways. God, shape us, use us, draw us closer to you, Jesus, in every way. Thank you, God. Amen. So now, let's, uh, let's eat the cracker that represents his body and remember that it was broken for us. Thank you, God. Now let's drink the juice together that represents Jesus' blood that was spilled for us. Thank you, God. We remember what you've done, God. Remember how good you are, Jesus. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. You, you may be seated. Thank you for worshiping and singing with us and, and taking this time of communion together. Oh, yeah. Um, you can pass the cups to the middle aisles here, and they'll be picked up by the ushers. You can just stack them as they go along the row. Thank you. Good morning, church. Uh, it is great to see you all. Um, I am coming to give you an update on our Kingdom Builders campaign where we had our Commitment Sunday a couple of uh, weeks ago and uh, give you a bit of an update. I'm also going to share a few facts about our mortgage and uh, kind of where we're at with the new financial situation. And uh, if you're wondering why I'm doing this, my name is Jonathan. I'm on church council. Uh, but uh, I'm also a banker, and so I think uh, Pastor Marlowe wanted me to <laughs> kind of give some banking information to everyone. And uh, the bank I work for rhymes with my daughter's last name, Evie, so you can kind of figure out which, uh, which bank I, I work for. Had some bad news in the news, uh, bad times in the news <laughs> recently, but you can talk to me about that afterwards uh, <laughs> if you want. Um, is this being recorded? No, just joking. Yeah, yeah, it's fine. It's fine. Um, so anyway, so our mortgage is going to be, uh, it, our final draw just happened. It's about $2.75 million. And so what that works out to is about $22,000 a month is going to be our mortgage payment. Now, I'm going to let you in on a little banking secret. The banks don't like it when we pay off our mortgage faster because they lose interest. So I think we have an opportunity here to pay this off faster. And in fact, our mortgage allows us to do 15% more every year. And so that works out to doing the quick math of 400, approximately $400,000 a year that we could pay extra. Now you're probably wondering, we got to pay our 22,000. That's okay. That's part of our regular giving. And I'll talk about that in a second, but we have an opportunity to do more and pay it off faster. And so in light of that, I am grateful to share that in the first two Sundays of this campaign, we have actually raised an additional 30,000 extra above and beyond our regular giving to pay uh, towards our mortgage or towards building costs uh, in the future. 
Uh, but there's also a huge opportunity for us to do more. And as we approach the year end here, I encourage you all to think about, is there an opportunity for you to give additional funds above and beyond our regular giving so that we can make an extra payment right out of the, right out of the, um, I don't know what the right metaphor is, the horse uh, carousel or whatever it is, to get it paid down uh, faster. And it's because we want to get out of, the, out of the door and get this thing paid off. And when you think about that, you know, I, I, if we can pay this thing down, like think of what we could spend $20,000 a month on that would be m even better than paying off a mortgage. There is so much opportunity for this church to use that money to minister to this community and to give to ministries that need to happen for this church. And beyond that, like, when you think about this, that Pastor Marlowe and, and, and Heather and Harvey have shared recently about how it was other churches that gave money that allowed this church to start and other donations of, of time and, and, and uh, land. We can be that for the next thing. The, paying off this mortgage isn't the end. It's actually the beginning of what new, the new things God wants us to do. Because God wants to use this church to do great things in the future, not just right here in, in Beaumont right now. And so I'm, I'm really passionate about that. And our council is, and I know many of you are, to see this church be a blessing beyond just this, this community and beyond this, this, these four walls here. But we want to be beyond that. And so I encourage us all to really reflect on how we can participate in that so that we can start our next journey towards uh, paying that off. But we don't do this with compulsion. You know, we, we believe in uh, 2 Corinthians 9, 7, where it says, each of you should share, should give uh, as you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. This isn't about making us feel bad about like needing to give. No, this is about joy, the joy of giving. But also as a banker, I will tell you that if you don't do it consistently, financial things that don't happen consistently don't happen. They just uh, this is the reality. We do budgeting advice all the time at the EV bank, and uh, we, we give people advice, and it's all about regularity and consistency. Now, that looks different for all of you. I understand that. Some of you earn income in different ways, but I encourage consistency, and that's biblical as well. If you look at Proverbs 3, 9, and 10, it says, honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of your crops. Then your barns will be filled with over, to overflowing, and your vats will brim over with new wine. And so, you know, we, we actually encourage people to give regularly, like especially our high net worth customers, they, we encourage them to give money away because we know it's good for them. We actually don't know why. Like it's like kind of the financial industry has like discovered this mystery. We know from scripture that why we do it, but they, we give that advice. And so I encourage all of you to have that a part of your regular, um, regular part of your life. So there's really two things I'm leaving with you. And I'm going to pray here for a moment is one be consistent in your regular giving so that it happens regularly and we meet our financial obligations of paying our mortgage. And then second of all, between now and the end of the year especially, think of how you can do something additional to pay down that mortgage faster so we can take that 22000 and spend it on this community and ministry and plan for the future of what God has for us because he has something he wants to do beyond just uh, the here and now. So. You can bow with me in prayer as we pray for this. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for this beautiful church. I don't mean this building. I mean these beautiful people in front of me. Thank you for their faithfulness in how they've given their time and energy, whether it's helping with, with children's ministry or helping with food for people or whether it's volunteering at different events for women's ministry and men's ministry. There's just The list goes on. We could stay here for a long time and thank you for all these people. But we want to also just pray that you would help us to be faithful and consistent in our financial contributions as well to this ministry. Because you say in your scripture that when we give our first fruits, you will bless us. And so we commit to that, Lord. We commit, and I commit to that in front of everyone as well, to do that. And we just pray that you would um, really just lay that on our hearts in a very clear way, not in a, in a heavy way, like it says in Corinthians, with joy. That we would have joy as we enter this um, this season of going to the end of the year and, and potentially making some additional contributions, but also for consistency as we, uh, as we end off the year as well. So we pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Good morning, everyone. My name is Joel. I'm the Discipleship Pastor, and these are your Sunday morning church announcements. If you're exploring Eagle Mott Church, we want you to know that we are so excited to have you here, and we'd love to answer any questions you may have. So, please fill out the I'm New card that you'll find in the chair pocket in front of you, and then either drop it in the slot at the gray kiosk in the lobby, or take it with you to our newcomers lounge after the gathering today. It's located out the auditorium doors to the right down the hall. Our hosts would love to meet you there. 
Take your iNew card with you and you'll receive a voucher for a complimentary specialty coffee from our cafe. You can also fill out this card online by going to eaglemont.info. Thanks so much for giving us the opportunity to help you find a place of belonging here at Eaglemont. On the second Sunday of every month, we highlight the opportunity we each have to financially give to world missions. Our collective giving is making a positive difference for Christ in our world. So thank you for your part in that. You can give by using the debit machine again at the gray kiosk in the lobby, or by going to eaglemont.info to see all the ways you can give online. We want to make you aware of a new small group opportunity. Welter and Janice Furzma will be hosting a group in their home on Wednesday evenings at 7 p.m. starting on November 13th. This group will be studying through the New Testament book of Romans. The group will meet for six weeks before Christmas and then another six weeks starting again later in January. To register, go to eaglemont.info, click on the small groups tab, then scroll down to Welter and Janice's group and hit the sign up button. Prayer Encounter is next Sunday at 4 p.m. Be sure to join us on the second floor lounge as three of our Eaglemont young adults lead us in this prayer time. You may have heard us announce Stewardship Sunday on November 24th. Along with this Sunday about handling money God's way is the opportunity to have your will, written or power of attorney document prepared at no charge. However, we want to make you aware that this service provided by our Pentecostal Assemblies of Canada International Office will only be made available to those who take the Radical Stewardship Seminar that is happening in our gathering on Sunday, November 24th. So make sure you join us on that Sunday. As December quickly approaches, we have the opportunity to share the love of Christ through our annual Christmas Hamper Program, which works to help support families in our community who are in need of extra support this Christmas. You can participate in one of two ways. One, if you are aware of a family who could use some support this Christmas, you can nominate them to be a recipient of a hamper. Or two, you can donate towards the purchase of a hamper. To nominate or donate, go to eaglemont.info and click on the Christmas Hamper button. Thanks so much for your participation in this ministry of generosity. Have a great Sunday, everyone. You heard Pastor Joel refer to the debit machine, I believe. Uh, I understand it's not working today. So just so you're aware of that at the kiosk, there's a slot there for cash and checks. But uh, And Maureen's away on vacation this week and into the next. So we're going to have to figure it out. Uh, for next Sunday. So uh, pressure is on. I, I feel it. But I'm not even joking. Maureen is such a blessing in our church office, our administrative assistant for many, many years. Yeah, actually, I think she is here today. She's downstairs in ministry to the kids. So you can let her know that we gave her an applause of appreciation this morning. But a couple things before we dive in. If you have a vehicle like a Suburban or a Yukon or even a minivan, we're looking for shuttle drivers for Christmas Eve. We've made the decision, we'll see if it's the right one, to just have one Christmas Eve service at 5 o'clock on December 24th. I don't I anticipate it'll be full. And so we're making space because when, this, when, the, when the parking lot is full, just the way the ratios are based on our Sunday morning ratios in this footprint that we have here and the seating. When the parking lot is full, we will have about 475 in here. And Miriam counted the chairs after Cliff and Brian rearranged them, and thanks for that hard work for doing that. She counted up and down 595. So 600. So we need to have a little shuttle service. We got permission from the Aquafit Center right to our, the west of us to park in the northeast parking lot. We've got one shuttle driver volunteer, uh, agreed to do it already. So if a couple of you that have a vehicle like that could, could start at 4.15 over there, just bring people back and forth and then drive them back after Christmas Eve. Seems like a long ways away, but some of these details we need to kind of start to nail down because Christmas is coming. Hopefully, the snow waits till Christmas Eve. Let, let's, let's pause and pray into that right now. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, on another note, if you're newer in the orbit of 
Eagle Mont Church family, I, I really hope that this Thursday night you'll take in the Discovering Church Life session that I'm leading. It's only 75 minutes. It's a place where you can get to know the church a little better. Some of what we believe, some of what we do, uh, some of our personality. Uh, maybe I've not met you before. I would love to meet you there. If you're, again, if you're a newcomer um, or to chat, if we've already met, to chat further. So go on the uh, eaglemont.info site, of course, and click on the Discovering Church Life button. There's also a four-minute video that I I would ask you to watch there as well. Look forward to, to seeing you. Um, also, you may well, if you live in Beaumont, may be well aware of the city um, Remembrance Day ceremony tomorrow at the community center at 10.30 a.m. Just wanted to mention that. You may want to take that in. Lord, thanks for this time in your word. We pray that it would speak to us and that we would be open to how you want to direct our lives and lead lovingly, lead our lives through what we hear from your word today, and we pray it in Jesus' name. We're continuing in our Gospel of John series. If you're here for the first time today, we've been in this series since, uh, well, for quite a, quite a bunch of months. Uh, the message today, true belief. Jesus had entered Jerusalem, and knowing that, as he put it, his time had come, and that's a reference, of course, to his time of dying on the cross, and in entering into Jerusalem, he still had uh, several days where he, we see the final words and words of comfort, words of teaching for his followers. Jesus was also dialoguing with the crowd, and the question they asked him in the last verse of last week's passage, although if you were here last week, we didn't, uh, Pastor Joel spoke, and because of the focus on the many uh, people that got baptized, He just focused on one verse, but the the last verse of that passage, uh, we see the people questioning, uh, they're questioning Jesus in in verse, uh, what is it here, verse 34, uh, where they just said, just who is this son of man? Who is this son of man anyway? They're a little confused because the son of man, Jesus, uh, was talking about dying, but their understanding of the Messiah was that he would live forever. So they couldn't put two and two together. Of course, not knowing that he would die and rise from the dead. Our passage today, John 12, 35 to 50, and we're going to read piece by piece as we move through the passage. So in verse 35, we see the response of Jesus to this question that came to him from the crowd. Who is this son of man Anyway, and son of man is really a, a reference to his deity. If you, if you dive into it, you'll, uh, we won't take time to do that now, but it's a, it's, he used that term of himself many times, and it was a, a reference to the fact that he was uh, God, but God in human flesh. Uh, Jesus replied in uh, verse 35, my light will shine for you just a little longer. Walk in the light while you still can, so the darkness will not overtake you. Those who walk in the darkness cannot see where they are going. Jesus, once again, uses the metaphor of light to talk about himself. Open Bible online uh, lists 43 times in the New Testament where light is used to refer to Jesus. Jesus makes it clear that he wants everyone to walk in the light so darkness that, it, in, uh, so, so that darkness that indeed is all around will not overtake them. You, you see, those who, those who have not surrendered their lives to Jesus Christ and who have not trusted in him as the forgiver of their sin and the leader of their life, are walking in darkness. Now, lights are going to come on in a moment. I'm glad there's no crying kids. That was my fear right now. (laughs) If you attempted to walk, now we got a little bit of light from whatever, but if you attempted to walk out of this auditorium with the lights out right now, I got to be careful when I move around here. A little, little treacherous. But my friends, not near as treacherous as trying to navigate life in the darkness of being disconnected from God, your creator. Lights on, please. Tech people are awesome, hey? There are many examples of this darkness that that Jesus and the New Testament refer to, and it's not... 
(laughs) The darkness is not all out there. Because the darkness in our world is a direct result of the darkness that is in every human heart because of the sin nature we're all born with. The Apostle Paul, writer of Romans uh, chapter 7 verse 18, he describes this in himself. He says, I know that nothing good lives in me. That, um, I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my sinful nature. I want to do what is right, he says, but I can't. And he's got this struggle. Some of you know it. At least he can't consistently. He's frustrated with this struggle. With the evil and the darkness and the sin. That his human nature all too often gives evidence of. Jesus is referring to the spiritual darkness that causes us to not be able to truly see until we open our life to Jesus Christ. This darkness is then evidenced in broader culture, and we've seen it, haven't we, in many, in many ways throughout history. Evil, destructive, dark things, often accepted as good by various societies over time, various cultures, cultures that are blind and are walking in complete darkness. We have our own examples. <laughs> I'm going to take several minutes right now to unpack a current example. And you'll recognize it quickly. Pastor and author James Emery White, who wrote, has written a number of books, uh, pastors at a large church in the U.S. Uh, one of the great books he, he wrote is about Generation Z. I say that because I'm not American. Miriam always says Z, just kind of bugs me, but whatever, that's, that's between us, we'll work that out. But uh, James Emery White, a recent blog of his was entitled, Still Don't Believe in Slippery Slopes? He writes this, one of the marks of metamodernism, now that's a reference to the current age uh, that we're in, there was, as many of you know, modernism, the uh, the age of reason, and then postmodernism, the age of skepticism of reason, and now he refers to it metamodernism, which can be illustrated with an image of a pendulum constantly oscillating between creation and destruction, hope and doubt, optimism and realism, as one article I read described it. This is an age of uncertainty, an age of uh, um, unstable footing, and it is. White writes that one of the characteristics of this age is that people self-diagnose who they are and then over-narrate their identity under the impression that they're bettering their mental health. He says the next step is often that they let their chosen identity become the authority of who they are and how others must view them. He writes, once you begin identifying yourself as you wish rather than how you were made, of course referring to God's creation, He says from there, there's no limit to the potential insanity. He continues, consider gender identity issues. Gender dysphoria is a real, he compassionately says, is a real real thing and can begin at a very young age. But something is happening with this generation that is different. He goes on to tell the story of a 14-year-old girl who was confused about her identity. She learned about various uh, gender identities as she explored on an online social community. There she also learned that she could take testosterone as a next step in her movement toward this trans identity. She began cross-hormone therapy. She found that getting that treatment was easy. A consultation with a counselor who asked uh, just a few basic questions about how she was healing. Looking back on it, this young lady said, I had all these rehearsed answers that I didn't genuinely believe, but it's popular, she said, for the trans community to help each other rehearse what to say to the doctors. It wasn't long after she had started cross-hormone therapy that she began experiencing many emotional, physical, mental problems, and the freedom to be herself didn't come, only further disillusionment, which is an often repeated but seldom reported scenario. 
She eventually decided to detransition back to female, and of course, that's not without significant difficulties as well. Stories, stories like this have, have grown all too common, and, and God's heart of love, you need to hear this, God's heart of love, and maybe you're engaging online, and this is a, something that's going on inside of you, God knows, God sees his heart of love and compassion for people walking through such inner tur- uh, turmoil and pain is huge, his heart for you. But sadly, often people in those types of, that type of pain don't, just don't know it yet that God is there and God cares and God has a plan and a purpose for the way he created you originally and wants you to flourish and you're able to flourish in that physically, mentally, uh, relationally as God created you to be. Current cultural thinking is that who you deem yourself to be is who you are and no one can or should disagree. In in this culture that has removed a, a loving creator God from the equation of life, you are the ultimate authority. You are your own God, even to the point of determining your sex and gender as as if they're different, and, and, and as if they're, you know, that is something that we can choose. It's not. It's not. In the same blog, White wisely points out, when those who embrace this philosophy are challenged regarding the obvious slippery slope on which it rests, as an example, he says, what if someone wanted to self-identify as a dog? Inevitably, there's pushback. That's crazy. No one would do that. He writes, that's the way all slippery slope arguments are rebutted. That wouldn't happen. That's fear-mongering. Well, he says, in this blog, recently written, a school in Scotland has just allowed a child with Species dysphoria to identify as an animal. How sad. First, he says, first we rush to affirm uh, those who felt that their body was the wrong sex. Now, he says, we have our first case to affirm a child who feels their body is the wrong species. Slippery slope leads, he says, down any number of rabbit holes to insanity and sadness because it's not God's best plan for anyone. Society's typical response to this can, can somehow be made to sound loving, and it's not. It's dark for a number of reasons, but fundamentally because it's dark because it replaces a loving God in the individual's life with themselves in charge. I don't want to be in charge of my own life. I don't. It's a modern cultural example of the reality of the darkness that Jesus is referring to in this John passage, written so many centuries ago. Verse 35, 36. Those who walk in the darkness cannot see where they are going. Put your trust in the light while there is still time. Time's running out. I mean, generations have said that. And every generation, every year, every day, we're a little closer to that great day of the Lord, as the Bible calls it, the end, where we stand before God. While there is still time, Jesus says, then you will become children of the light. There's a teaching point that is important here as well. And I want to make it just briefly. Uh, please, Please hear this. People quite often, I find, think that becoming a Christ follower happens in uh, uh, degrees or stages, or, or they, think, they think of it as uh, levels of performance or getting my stuff together first, and then somehow progressing toward the point of finally being able to be acceptable to God and, and being able to come to Him. <laughs> the, the Bible does not teach that we could make ourselves acceptable to God. It does not. By cleaning things up, 
in our lives first. No, we're actually only acceptable to God because of what Jesus did on the cross and the cleaning up process. That's the, that's the becoming like Christ in our character journey is the job of the Holy Spirit with our cooperation on the other side of just expressing faith and confidence in who Jesus is and what he did on the cross and I'm in his family immediately for eternity. Don't, don't be tricked into thinking otherwise we first come as we are and receive his grace and forgiveness and again instantaneously a welcome into his eternal family the very moment we choose to express our faith in him verse 36 put your trust in the light and then you will become children of the light in that very moment of expressed faith we move from darkness to light from death to life as John later in the uh, as, sorry earlier in the book John 5 24 clearly says I tell you the truth those who listen to my message Jesus speaking and believe in God who sent me have eternal life they will never be condemned for their sins but they have already passed from death into life moving on verse 36 the last part of the verse after saying these things Jesus went away and was hidden from them this was the end of his public ministry and public teaching of Jesus as far as John's record goes and then the very next sentence that John writes is a very sad reality verse 37 despite all the miraculous signs Jesus had done most of the people did not believe in him we, we often think oh a miracle will do it and miracles are great God can do anything and we trust him and we ask him for the miraculous yes that's God honoring and powerful for sure but we often think it's the, you know, the silver bullet to getting someone across the line of faith. Not so. Not so today. Not so in Scripture. Because there's the, the, the posture of the heart that still, it, it, God still requires submission, surrender. Uh, that's enough to keep some people away. And John goes on to quote from the Old Testament book of Isaiah, who predicted the sad reality of many people having a hardened heart and blinded spiritual eyes. The, the word believe is used a few times in the next few verses, but sadly, it's that the people would not or could not believe because they allowed their hearts to become hardened. In verse 40, John quotes from Isaiah's difficult words. If you know this passage, uh, at least initially difficult to to what is he saying? That the Lord has blinded their eyes and heart. The Lord has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts so that their eyes cannot see and their hearts cannot understand. And they cannot turn to me and have me heal them. I, I, inwardly and, and otherwise. Leon Morris in his commentary uh, of this uh, passage comments on these, again, hard to, hard to understand words. He says that when John quotes from Isaiah that the Lord has blinded their eyes. John does not mean that the blinding takes place without the will or against the will of the people, of the person. No, the, the hardening of one's heart is, is definitely the choice of the person involved. John is simply making, you know, wanting to make it clear that the hand of God in this whole process, in other words, God's purposes are not frustrated by the opposition of those who reject him. And in, in actually, in this specific example of the Jews rejecting and having hardened hearts, rejecting the gospel of Jesus, it was that very fact which resulted in this same good news message of Jesus being taken then to the whole world beyond the Jewish people. And that, that was a God thing, precipitated by the hardness of, of the hearts of many people, uh, many Jewish people. Commentator Merrill Tenney, in his, uh, in his book, uh, Commentary on this uh, Gospel, provides a helpful comment. Uh, he says, the, you know, the cumulative F effect of unbelief is a hardened attitude that becomes more imp imp impenetrable. Let's all say it together. One, two, three. Impenetrable. You can say it. Good. I was stumbling there. Uh, I just need practice. The cumulative effect of unbelief is a hardened attitude that becomes more impenetrable as time progresses. Have you seen that? Maybe that was your trajectory at some point. In other words, the more you reject the gospel, the harder your heart becomes. So it could be said that it, it could be said that God hardened their hearts by his simple 
act of repeatedly presenting his offer of relationship with him. And and that protracted offer made some recipients of that offer increasingly obstinate. It happens. And then there was another sad scenario played out that John describes here, verse 42 and 43, very sad words. Many people did believe in him, however, uh, including some of the Jewish leaders. Oh, great. They chose to believe in Jesus, but they wouldn't admit it for the fear, for, for fear that the Pharisees would expel them from the synagogue, for they loved human praise more than the praise of God. They quote unquote believed, that's really not the biblical meaning or definition of of true belief, just keeping it in here, intellectual assent to truth. It's not New Testament terminology or description of what what belief is, but for purposes of this scenario, John's saying that there there were some that believed, but, but they they kept it in their minds, and, and it didn't change how they responded outwardly to Jesus, because very sadly, verse 43, they loved human praise more than praise of God. They cared more about what people thought than God thought. I won't ask for a show of hands, but I'll put mine up. Anybody ever been there? Oh, thank you. You guys have a mercy gift, compassion. Yeah. Who of us haven't at some point? Whether, whether in junior high as we pull back from peer pressure or as a business executive who you know, has all the confidence related to business but then, then is, 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 is fearful of the repercussions of, uh, of maybe not having that advancement in career if I live my life as a Christian too outwardly. And we're not talking about being obnoxious. Because Christians can be that. Don't be an obnoxious Christian. Don't be a, I got all the answers, Christian, right? You guys know that. Yeah, well, you can fill in the scenario, the examples of your own life. When, when, when you love the affirmation of people more than pleasing God, if that's the case right now for you, my Christian friend, please talk to God about that. Ask his forgiveness and, and he'll forgive you for that failure is what it is. And asking Jesus, the baptizer, to immerse you and baptize you in the Holy Spirit. Acts 1a tells us the purpose for the coming of the Holy Spirit in this way is that we might have the power to witness effectively, lovingly, wisely for Jesus Christ. Let's skip to verse 46 as we wrap up. He brings it back around to the important topic of him being the light. I have come as the light to shine in the dark world so that all who put their trust in me will no longer remain in darkness or in the dark. There's your invitation from from Jesus himself to step out of the darkness you are living in if you have not surrendered your life to Christ yet, and and step into the light. In other words, into a personal and eternal relationship with the very God who created you, loves you most, knows you best. Jesus makes it clear in verse 47 and 48 that he didn't come to judge the world, but to save the world by offering himself, as we celebrated at communion today, on the cross as the full payment for the sin. Sin so bad it required death. Because when we sin, we die in here. Our relationship with God is dead, but can be brought to life by surrendering to the life-giving God of the universe. If you're not sure what your standing will be before God on that day, see, Jesus, yeah, he's, he's not judging now. But he does refer in this passage to the day of judgment coming, verse 48, when there will, there will either be access to heaven granted to those who have placed their trust in Christ and followed him, or very sadly, a sentence of eternal separation from God forever, eternally, it's just in a place 
called hell for those who rejected Christ. A place that was never created for human beings, but rather for, the, for Lucifer and his angels and the story of, of uh, the narrative of when he, he, he rebelled against God. And that's the, that's the place God made for, for, for them, the fallen angels. Breaks no one's heart more than it does God's to see people enter into an eternal separation, a state of eternal separation. That's, that itself is, I think, the greatest torment of hell. No matter what you think about the other elements of torment there, the greatest, knowing that you, knowing that you, not, and know, that you will know that you're eternally separated from the, the pain of that. The consternation, that's not even a word. I'm struggling for a word right now. I, can't, I just can't, I can't wrap my head around, around that, what that would be like. And it breaks no one's heart more than God's. That, that sadly will be the case for some. So if you're not sure of your standing before God and what your standing will be before God on that day, you can know for sure in this moment by repenting of your sin, which simply means turning and going the other way, turning, turning away from your old way of living and receiving God's forgiveness completely and making the, the eternity-shaping decision to walk in the way of Jesus and to walk with Jesus as your closest companion and forgiver and leader. If you've never done that, I, I hope and pray that you will today. Engaging online, we've, we've, we've heard uh, over the last number of months, maybe more, um, you know, the occasional expression of uh, just, just recently someone uh, met me in the lobby or I met them and they'd been in church three times, but were tracking with us in the live stream for a year. It's a great place to explore. And so if you're exploring faith and trying to have your questions answered about who Christ is, keep, keep engaged with those questions. Keep asking those questions. But today might be your day to make the decision. You may not have all the answers. I don't. But there's enough that we need to know. God has given us all that we need to know very clearly, very simply to enter into that relationship with him. Still a lot of questions on other stuff. God loves me, but my sin separates me from him. He died on the cross as the full payment for the penalty of that sin so that I could go free as I place my trust in him. Four simple things. And maybe today is your day. I want us to watch as we conclude um, a brief video, Dr. William Lane Craig of reasonablefaith.org that really is, uh, um, talks to us about what true belief entails. So watch this and then we'll conclude. So you've just become a Christian. The moment you responded to Christ, a number of things happened to you. First, you were given new life. You began a relationship with God that will last forever. Second, you gained a new status before God. You went from being under God's just condemnation to being fully pardoned of all your sins. Third, you were adopted into a new family as a child of God. You now belong to a huge and incredibly diverse global family. Fourth, you were given a new job. You now represent Christ with your words and actions to everyone you meet. God wants to grow his family through you. Fifth, you also have new enemies, so expect trouble. This world will pressure you to conform your old nature will betray you, and the forces of darkness will oppose you. But you also have a powerful new ally. The instant you committed your life to Christ, God's Spirit moved in and took up permanent residence in your heart and mind. Allow Him to empower and guide you 
as your journey unfolds, keeping you on the right path. If you stumble and do wrong, confess it immediately to God. Claim His forgiveness and yield yourself anew to God's Spirit. The productive Christian does not rely on his own efforts. Rather, he relies on God's Spirit. As the Apostle Paul wrote, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives through me. When a branch is connected to the vine, it just produces fruit naturally. On the other hand, the unproductive Christian is performance-oriented. He tries to be good enough by his own grinding self-effort, but feels guilty because he can never do enough. Trying to live the Christian life in your own strength just makes you miserable. So, how do you rely on the Holy Spirit on a daily basis? First, as soon as you are aware of any sin in your life, confess it to God. Don't hide and rationalize your disobedience. God is eager to forgive and draw you near again. Then recommit yourself, body and soul, in continual daily surrender to God. Ask His Spirit to guide you and strengthen you. As this Spirit-filled life within you grows, you will be gradually transformed. You'll hunger for the truth of God's Word, the Bible. Begin reading it today and invite God's Spirit to teach you as you go. You can start with the Gospel of Mark. You'll also learn to live in community with other believers. Following Jesus is not something you do in isolation. Get together with other believers to worship, pray, and study the Bible. And remember, each of us is a work in progress. So be patient with the shortcomings of your brothers and sisters, just as God is patient with you. Following Christ is the adventure of a lifetime. Your day-to-day -day experience may not get easier. In fact, you may face greater hardships, but you will sense the deep satisfaction of knowing God and enjoying Him forever. Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you by my righteous right hand. That's true belief. You may want to take that step of surrender to Christ today if you haven't already. This is your invitation. Romans 10, 9 says, if, if you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. Saved from yourself, saved from your sin, saved from internal separation from him. What a gift. So if you've never made that decision to be a Christ follower, you can do that simply by expressing that to him in prayer. And I'm gonna lead you in a prayer for those that, that wanna pray this. You can, you can pray it in your heart. You can pray it out loud, you can whisper it as I, as I pray it, but I'm gonna ask everybody to pray. And Christians, I know you're gonna be praying for those who may be at that place of, of making a decision like this. And so you're gonna be joining with me in prayer for uh, those of you who are uh, you know, on the cusp of making that great and exciting decision. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes and just talk to God for a moment. If you wanna accept Christ today, you can express it in your own words or something like this, Lord Jesus, I confess you as the Lord of my life. I surrender to you as the leader of my life right now. Please forgive my sin. I want to follow you. I believe that you died to pay the penalty for my sin and you rose again by the power of God to prove that you can deliver eternal life to me. I surrender to you now. Thank you for making me your child, your eternal son or daughter, and adopting me into your eternal family. Guide me, Lord, in this new relationship with you, that I would love your word, and connect with the body of Christ, and grow in this new relationship.
just as your heads are still bowed, your eyes are closed, I'm going to ask if you prayed that prayer for the first time today, if you're engaging online, you can, you can click on the QR code and let us know. We want to help you. We want to be excited and celebrate with you. Uh, and, and if you in this, in this room here pray that prayer for the first time, I, I won't call you out, but I, I want to pray just a brief concluding prayer for you. I'd love the opportunity to meet you after. Is there anybody in this place that prayed that prayer to accept Christ into your life today for the first time? Raise your hand, look my way real quick. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. God, I thank you for the work of your loving spirit in our lives, in our hearts, in our minds, even in these moments that we've been together today. Thank you for these two individuals that indicated that they made that step. We're excited about that, but not near as excited as heaven is right now. (laughs) We give you thanks for showing us your love on the cross. And Lord, I pray that as these individuals surrender to you, in this moment, surrender to you, that you would help them with that, because that can be a scary thing. But God, we know that it does not have to be, because you love us so much. I pray you'd strengthen them in their relationship with you, and they would find ways to, to be strengthened in their Christian faith and in their relationship walk with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Little, 50 little booklets across the stage here. What if it's true? Just some great, if you're a seeker, come and grab one. If you have a friend who's seeking uh, regarding faith, and following Christ, some, some great, is it, what if, what if it's true that Jesus is who he claimed to be? What if it's true that the Bible has the answers to questions? What if it's true that the church is more than just hypocrites? What, like some, some oh, good little chapters. Even I can read that in one sitting. Uh, Some of the stuff that Alpha has been dealing with, hey? And all. And so, anyway, those are there for you to grab today. A few concluding comments from Pastor John, I think. You're right. You're right. Thanks, Pastor Bell, for the amazing message. Um, So, my name's John. I'm the Youth and Young Adults Pastor here at Egamont Church. Um, I'm wearing a hat. I know it's like, it's whatever. Um, some of you might be like, how, how could John wear that? That's so fair. I normally don't. Uh, but I have a bit of a story, all right? Um, so we had a retreat. Uh, did anyone go? Anyone? Raise your hands. Anyone went? Awesome. Yeah, it was, it was awesome. It was fantastic. Um, and while we were doing the retreat, um, Destiny tells me, she's like, oh, I'm in cosmetology class. I'm like, awesome. Sick. Good for you. Can I buzz your hair and dye it? I'm like, um, I, uh, I, I, I'll think on that. I'm, I'm sorry. Um, but to me, I'm like, okay, I think she has to do this for class. I'm not sure. So I guess I'll commit just because I care about her so much. Okay? And another kid pipes up. Eric Tess, can to name names? If he's watching today, shout out. Um, he's like, all right, if I make this shot, I get to do the first buzz, and she gets to choose the hair color. I'm like, ooh, I don't know, man. I don't know. Now, he's like three feet away from like, you know, three-point line. I'm like, mm. I don't know, basketball nets up against the wall, so it's even farther than a regular three-point. Make him take five, six steps back, six feet away. I'm like, hey, I'm safe. I'm good. We're okay. We're okay. We're fine. We're okay. Makes the shot, nothing but net, and here's the hair. So uh, that is essentially, that's not the story of today. That's not going to clean your house. I just share that. But um, anyways, so... I'm sorry, I'm laughing at myself knowing that you all can see me. Um, so uh, what I also want to do is just really bring, bring forward, um, besides committing to youth ministry, awesome, um, some amazing volunteers and leaders that we actually have. So on Tuesday nights, we have this amazing ministry called Clyde, where kids in grade 5 to 8 can actually connect, get to know Jesus a little bit more, even if they're kind of on the far reaches of even knowing who Jesus is, it's a space for them to connect, find a safe spot, and actually get to know about him a little bit more. I'm going to ask my whole lead team to come up, who actually run the whole night, so I can still be a young adults pastor at the same time. I was give them a round of applause. They're amazing. (laughs) 
So I've given them the fearful job of speaking on stage, um, and I'm so happy that they're willing to stretch this way, so I will give it their way. Hi, everyone. I'm Crystal. So on a typical night at Clyde, the kids arrive at 6.30, and we have a concession open and a little bit of time for them to hang out. The rec room's open, they play games, they connect. Um, and then we move into like an icebreaker game, and they're usually geared towards the kids getting to know each other, um, learning different things about each other's interests and stuff like that. So they, um, we break them into smaller groups for that. After that is done, we do a wide game, which is either like throughout the whole church where they get to run and explore the whole church, or uh, in our gym, we like to play dodgeball or hide and seek. Um, lots of different fun games that John's come up with and the team have come up with. Um, and then we come back and we usually sit down and we have um, a short message or we have another small group time where the kids get to uh, join into some discussion. And from there we move into a snack and the kids get another like 20 minutes to connect and hang out and just get to know each other. It's been a real blessing to be part of this team. Yeah, John asked us to come up because um, he wanted us to say why we're volunteering and for me, it was easy because my son started last year, and this year our daughter comes, so we just decided to do it to, we want to raise our kids in a Christian home, and we'd love them to have a strong faith through junior high into high school. So, yeah, I guess growing up, I attended a youth group, but I attended in a neighboring community. And when I look back, um, I actually wish I went to a youth group on my own town. You know, there's something about having a relationship with kids in the school that you go to. Now, my hope is that this generation could navigate the more difficult teen years, regularly connecting with a great group of kids that love God. Now, I know it's going to take some time to build these relationships, but honestly, I think it's worth it. And I guess the question we have for you is this, if it's worth it for you. Because at Collide, and I'm sure with the rest of the youth, like, we do actually need some more help. Um, last week, we had 32 kids, and uh, we do expect that to grow. Now, if you're like me, you may know you're not cool at all, but that doesn't matter. Still, come, um, just spend time, connect with um, the kids. Um, you could come every week. You could come every so often. Really, it's just, just please come. Yeah, please prayerfully consider um, volunteering. And I can say for Mark and I, we both really enjoyed our time uh, being involved. And I will also say I will... I'm not committed enough, though, to shave my head or diet, so <laughs> don't think we ask that the rest of you either. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. Um, so I'm going to do one really awkward thing. So if anyone, like, volunteers in youth ministry, can you guys stand up? It's really awkward. I know. I know. Um, and I don't know if everyone is here today. Fantastic. Um, can we just give them a round of applause? Like, they are amazing doing what they do. I couldn't do any of this. This couldn't happen without them. Um, yeah. You guys can go back down. Um, so kind of one, one fa last final kind of couple pieces. I'm going to try to make this short and sweet, Milo. Hopefully under a minute. We know me. Probably not. Um, but uh, so as you can see on the back of the screen, next week Sunday, so on the 17th, right after spring break, we have a church after party. So basically what that is, is for our kids in our church, our youth in our church, as well as, um, yeah, those that go to your high schools that you've been wanting to invite to church, those friends that you have that are Christians in a non-Christian home and still kind of want to go to church but don't have a way in because their parents are kind of against it. Um, it's kind of a way for our kids in our church to connect because just as much as we need to make community possible on a Sunday morning, it's also just as important for that on a Sunday morning for our youth kids as well. So this is a, this is a time and a space for your kids to actually hang out with people their own age. So that's like all the way from grade six to grade 12. Uh, after the service, probably after kids are gone, so around like 1140, uh, we'll be downstairs, free pizza. Signing them up will be way easier because I can ensure everyone's going to get food, but I will buy extra just in case. Um, yeah, so that's kind of it. I'm really excited for it. It'll be a ton of fun. Um, that goes till about 2 p.m. They can leave whenever they want, but hopefully staying longer than shorter. Um, yeah, so final thing, if you are a newcomer, if you've been here for a little while, haven't really plugged in, connected, um, yeah, I just want to invite you to go to the newcomer's lounge. So that's kind of right around the corner. Just take a right. Sorry, I had to think about that really hard. Uh, take a right, and there it will be Bob and Jerry waiting for you to actually say hi um, and connect. So with that, besides connecting with them, hearing what we're about, you also get um, two free coffees at, at the cafe. 
Um, and yeah, for all of you today, if there are people you don't know, please take a chance to say hi, make community, make space to actually get to know each other, and have a great rest of your Sunday.